as of 2023, there are approximately 2.38 billion Christians worldwide. 2.38 billion. That number, it accounts for nearly one-third of the entire world's population, making Christianity the single largest religion in the world. But you know, it wasn't always that way. The first Christian census recorded after Christ's death and resurrection was a group of about 120 people, all gathered together in an upstairs room, nervously asking the same question that many of us still ask today. Where do we go from here? Now that Jesus is gone, now that he's not with us, what do we do? We've heard his teachings, we've seen how he does it, but how do we do it? How do we live all of this out? If you're joining us today, uh, we're, in the middle of, uh, we're in the middle of a series called True Friends, uh, where we're asking this question in the, context, on the, in the context of our friendships, meaning the people in our lives that we care deeply about and we desire to grow deeper with. In parts one and two of this series, uh, we looked at the principles that Jesus laid out in John chapter 15 when it comes to friendships. Uh, things like sacrificial living and honesty and vulnerability and speaking the truth in love. Uh, but now we turn the page from the how to the what, from how Jesus did it to how we can do it. Over the next few uh, messages in this series, uh, we're gonna ask the question, what exactly do these principles look like in our lives? What do they look like in our relationships? Well, luckily for us, we have a blueprint. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to the book of Acts in the New Testament. Um, as some of you know, Acts was written by a guy named Luke, uh, and he's documenting the life and the growth of the early church. By this time, the group has grown exponentially from 120 to over 3,000 people. We're going to jump right in at the end of Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, and we're going to read what it looked like for this group of 3,000, the first group of people trying to live out Christ-like friendship. It says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved." Okay, now on the surface, we might read this description and think, wow, they had it all together. Why don't we just like carbon copy what they do? Why don't we just structure our churches and our actions around the early church? And while that's not a wrong way to approach this, because yes, they did do a lot of really good things, which we're going to highlight over the next few messages, it's also just as important to note that it was not all sunshine and rainbows for the early church. The early church was not a perfect church. No, in fact, what we don't see directly from this passage is the, is the backdrop of conflict and controversy that they faced, both external and internal. We're going to look at some of the examples of that today, but it's important to note this as we begin and as we study this, the early church, because it makes them so much more relatable to the church today. I know I'm preaching to the choir when I say that the church today is also not perfect, we still see many internal and external conflicts and challenges. For example, here at Cornerstone, one of our core values is that we want to be a community of people who share our advantages with those that are less advantaged. This idea, it comes directly from Jesus in Philippians 2 verse 6, but it comes with a lot of challenges because it's such a difficult concept to live out. We don't really want to give up our advantages for the sake of others because we think, well, we've earned those advantages. We've worked hard for them. So we try to hold them tight. We, we defend them, which causes conflict and disagreement. Uh, we might argue over the definition of the word or the true meaning of Christ's intentions in Philippians 2. And I've seen those arguments get heated over the, over the past few years within our church. Another example is, is with the idea of inclusion. That's another core value here at Cornerstone. We want to be a church family that includes anyone and everyone, especially those that are not like us, which again, sounds great on the surface, but when people who are radically different than us start showing up within our spaces, it causes a level of discomfort and disruption. And that discomfort, it often leads to more controversy, more conflict. 
I mean, I could keep going, and that's just examples here within our church, within Cornerstone. I could also talk about conflict we face with friends, with family members, with neighbors, with in-laws, etc. See, conflict is something that all of us face within our relationships. But what stands out in that passage that we just read in Acts chapter 2 is that despite all of the conflict, the early church, they stuck together. They stuck together in community. They stuck together in friendship. In fact, that's a key theme early on in the book of Acts, how they just kept sticking together. They just kept coming together despite the conflict, despite the challenges. So that's what I want to talk about for the rest of our time today, how true friends and genuine community can really stick together through times of conflict and pressure. And to do this, I wanna look at two examples of conflict from the early church. The first example is found in Acts chapter six. So go ahead and flip over to Acts chapter six. We're gonna start this one in verse one. So let me read this conflict. It says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We will turn their responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal, it pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Okay, so the conflict in this case, it's centered around widows who were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. And this was a major deal in that time because in those days, women, they had very little opportunity to create wealth on their own. So widows were particularly vulnerable and oftentimes completely dependent on the community around them for survival. This is why caring for widows and orphans was such a major point of emphasis for God's people. In fact, Jesus' brother James, he goes as far as to write this. He says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. I mean, this was a big deal. Now, with that said, this was a lot more than an administrative issue about food distribution. There was a a deeper conflict that this was actually exposing. But in order to understand what that is, we have to know more about uh, about some of the details of the two groups that were highlighted back in verse 1. It says that the Hellenistic Jews were complaining against the Hebraic Jews. So what's, what's that mean? What's that about? Well, to make it simple, Hellenistic Jews were primarily Greek speaking from the dispersion meaning they lived in foreign countries and had therefore adopted some of the Greco-Roman lifestyle. While the Hebraic Jews, they remained near the homeland and they strictly spoke Hebrew. In other words, this wasn't just about food. This this was about discrimination. This was about one group crying out because they're being treated differently based on their background and where they come from, even what language they spoke. So how does the, the church handle this conflict? Well, it says that they chose seven leaders who were known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and they handed the keys over to them. They gave them the authority to address the problem. Now, first of all, that's a great strategy for conflict resolution that we can all emulate. Uh, we, We can all bring our struggles to people who we know are full of the spirit and wisdom and just simply seek their counsel. In fact, if you're currently in relational conflict, that's a great place to start. But that's just scratching the surface on what's going on here in Acts chapter six. There's a greater lesson a lesson here that goes even deeper and further than that. And we see it when we look closer at the names of those seven people that were chosen to lead. Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas. Those names, they might not mean anything to us, but they meant everything to them because those are all Greek names. Meaning that the church, they selected an entirely Hellenistic leadership team to address this problem. And that's so significant because it shows that the group that was crying out was being acknowledged, was being heard by the entire church. See, this was the church's way of saying, we hear you, we hear your struggle, we see your pain, we recognize where you've been overlooked and we want things to change. So here you go, show us the way. 
We're not going to pretend to know all the answers. We're not going to, to we're not going to pretend to have all the answers to all your problems, even though we know that we were actually the cause of many of these problems. We're going to avoid the temptation to defend ourselves so that we can listen to you. Because more than wanting to be understood, we want to understand. And see, so many times that's where conflict resolution, especially within groups, either happens or comes to a halt. It's in that tension that we face as humans when it comes to our differences. That tension to either hear others or be heard by others. To acknowledge someone else's perspectives and pain, even if we were the cause of that pain, or to reject it. To defend ourselves or our side. To say, no, that's not true. What you're saying isn't valid. I'm not like that. We're not like that. It wasn't my fault. I would never. They would never. And so on. The church in Acts 6, they chose the former. They chose to hear the other side. To acknowledge their differences, even though it was hard. Even though it was painful. Even though it meant that major changes needed to happen. And see, I believe that's what made the major difference. That's what strengthened their community and deepened their friendships, even through this conflict, because they acknowledged their differences. About a year ago, I got a front row seat to watch this kind of humble friendship in action. Uh, it was with my friend Chelsea, who some of you know is our Brentwood kids pastor. Uh, as you can see in the picture, uh, Chelsea has a smile that brightens up any room that she's in. She's also a strong and independent black woman and a Dallas Cowboys fan, but we're not going to hold that against her right now. Now, most importantly, though, Chelsea, she's my friend, and she's, friend with, and she's friends with so many people in our Brentwood campus, including several police officers. As you know, over the past uh, few years, there's been some tension between the black community and police officers. And usually that tension, it leads to division and misunderstanding and hurt feelings, but not with Chelsea. What's so cool about her is that she doesn't run away from the people on the other side. No, she runs towards them. I've gotten to watch her do this on a number of occasions. Usually when that tension heightens, maybe from a media story, I've seen her reach out and have conversations directly with police officers within our church community, sharing her perspective of what it's like as a black female and how hard it is to hear these things from her perspective. But she also takes the time to really listen to theirs to acknowledge and affirm how they're feeling, how they're processing this, even though it's hard, even though sometimes those conversations are stressful, even though they don't always see eye to eye or agree on everything. Just the process of listening and acknowledging each other, it's so healing. And almost every time by the end of the conversation, there's further understanding and empathy and care. And because it's Chelsea, there's lots of smiles and laughter. When I was talking to her about this this last week, I asked her and asking her for permission to share this story, I also asked her if those conversations have helped deepen and strengthen those friendships. And without hesitation, she said, oh yeah, for sure. And see, that's what's so beautiful. If we can enter into each other's stories and acknowledge each other's pain, then conflict won't divide us. It will actually do the opposite. It will unite us. It will bring us together. It will make our relationships stronger. And that's what happens in Acts chapter 6. So let me ask you right now, who might you need to acknowledge? Whose differences have you overlooked? Whose perspective have you ignored? Can you follow the example of the early church? Can you resist that temptation to defend yourself and instead lean in and listen to them? Even if it means that something in you might need to change? I mean, this is a major step in overcoming conflict and creating Christ-like friendship and community. But that's not all. There's another side to this coin, another side to this equation. It's not enough to see each other's differences. There's something else that, that has to happen to create an even deeper level of connection and friendship. But in order to see what this is, we need to look at a second major conflict from the early church. This one is found in Galatians chapter 2. Uh, you can flip over there now. Galatians is four books to the right from the book of Acts. Uh, we're going to jump right into the middle of a conflict between two key leaders uh, of the early church, uh, a guy named Cephas, who is more popularly known as Peter, 
and a man named Paul, who was the author of, of most of the letters in the New Testament, as well as the author of the, the letter we're about to, le- about to read, Galatians. Uh, here's what happens, starting in verse 11 of Galatians 2. It says this, when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him face to face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw uh, that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you are living like a Gentile and not a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Okay, so this is a pretty intense and public conflict between Peter and Paul. But the question is why? Like what's going on here that's making it so intense? Well, first and foremost, it says that Peter is acting like a hypocrite. I mean, one minute he's hanging out with the Gentiles, he's enjoying the freedom that he has in Christ as a Jewish man to eat and drink with Gentiles without pressuring them to adhere to any old covenant laws or customs in order to be saved, in order to be like them. But then the next minute, when, the big wig, when these bigwig Judaizers show up, Peter, he changes his tune. He separates himself from the Gentiles. He backs away. And Paul says, that's not okay, Peter. You can't do that. You're not acting in line with the gospel. And this goes back to the inclusion value I brought up earlier. Paul's saying, Peter, remember Jesus. Remember how radically inclusive he was. He didn't distance himself from Gentiles. He didn't pull back from outsiders when pressure from insiders came. So Peter, knock it off. You're not acting like Christ. You know better. Now this goes back to what we talked about last time. Paul speaks the truth in love to his friend Peter which is another thing that he learned from Jesus. But again, just like in Acts chapter six, there's an even deeper lesson here that we can learn to help us resolve conflict in a healthy way. And it comes from what Paul says next. Verses 15 and 16, Paul says this, we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles. Now let me stop there for a second because Paul calls them sinful Gentiles, but he's not name calling here. He's not putting them down. He's doing what we just talked about. He's acknowledging the differences between Jews and Gentiles. He's saying, Peter, you and I have that Jewish background, that old covenant law that runs through the back of our minds, constantly telling us what we can and cannot do, constantly telling us what's right and wrong. So I know it's hard to associate with Gentiles because they've been the enemy for so long. They're different than us in so many ways. They don't have that, 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 that same fear of the old covenant, of the old law that many of us have. But... Paul goes on to say this in verse 16. He says, We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in in Jesus Christ, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Okay, this is a big theological point that he's making, but the key to this whole response is the word to, T-O-O. Paul says, we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus for justification. In other words, yes, we're different than the Gentiles. We come from different backgrounds. We carry different baggage. But remember, Peter, we also have so much in common with them. In fact, we have the most important thing in common. We all rely on Christ and Christ alone. And this is the lesson here from this example. We have to remember what we have in common because that's what will ultimately unite us. That's what will bridge that gap, that divide, that conflict creates. See, it's not enough to just acknowledge our differences. It's not enough to just hear each other's stories and perspectives. Yes, that's part of it. That's a great first step. But we also have to remember the things that we all have in common. We have to remember the that the people that we're in conflict with are a lot more like us than they are different. This is what Paul's pointing out to Peter. He's saying, even though the Gentiles are different, they're also just like us. We're all human, Peter. We're all made in God's image. We're all in desperate need of God's grace. We're all just trying to find love and acceptance and justification. 
See, when we remind ourselves of these core truths when it comes to others, that's what unites us. That's what brings us back into fellowship and, and, and friendship and deep community. Now, what's so cool is, is Peter, uh, he, he, he takes this principle and he uses it to actually heal and unite the entire church. Go ahead and flip back over to the book of Acts. We're going to read one more story real quick in chapter 15. Paul and Barnabas, what's happening here is Paul and Barnabas, they're on their way uh, home to Jerusalem to report uh, to the church how their missionary journey is going. Uh, we're going to pick up the story in verse 3. Where are we at here? Acts 15. Yeah, verse 3. It says, the church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to, Jeru to Jerusalem, uh, they were welcomed by the church and the, and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Okay, so there it is again. There's that conflict, right, from Galatians 2. Paul and Barnabas are all excited about how God is moving in the hearts of Gentiles, how he's saving the Gentiles. But some people are uncomfortable with this. Some people are, are uncomfortable with the inclusiveness of the gospel. So they stand up and they say, wait a minute. That's cool that those other people, that those Gentiles are being saved. But now they have to become like us. They have to, to get circumcised and keep all of our, our Jewish laws and customs, etc. Now watch what happens. Watch who stands up to address this, verse 6. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up. Peter got up and he addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Guys, that's Peter talking. The same guy who flip-flopped from side to side, the hypocrite, the coward, but now he's standing up to the entire church, to the entire council, and he's saying enough is enough. We need to stop trying to force the Gentiles to become just like us. We need to stop trying to change who God, th who God made them to be. I know it's hard because they're different. And those differences, they can make us uncomfortable. Those differences, they might even make us a little bit angry. But we have to fully accept them just as they are. Why? Well, because Jesus did. Jesus didn't try to change them. Jesus didn't discriminate against them. No, he just loved them. He accepted them. He sacrificed for them, and he gave them his Holy Spirit, just like us. See, Peter's doing exactly what Paul did for him. He's acknowledging their differences. He's saying, yeah, that's real. The differences are real. But he's also reminding them of what they have in common. We're all made in God's image. We're all saved by his grace. We're all headed to the same place. And see, that's what matters most. That's what we have to remember. We have to remember, especially in times of conflict. We have to acknowledge our differences while remembering what we have in common. That's the formula we see weaved throughout the book of Acts and within this story of the early church. And remember, they weren't a perfect church either. And they didn't always get this right. In fact, sometimes their conflict, it did cause division. It did cause separation. Sometimes their conflict broke relationships. In fact, in just the very next chapter in Acts, chapter 16, Paul and Barnabas, some of the best friends, they split ways over a personal conflict and dispute that they had. I mean, these guys, they weren't a perfect church, but they were a beautiful church because they did their best to grow closer and closer together and reach further and further into the world around them. And the same is true today. We're still not a perfect church. We aren't going to always get this right, but let's do our best because God can use that. God can take our best and make it beautiful. This is how 120 became 2.38 billion. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for 
uh, just these stories that we get to read in this exciting uh, book, this New Testament, Lord, and the book of Acts, and some of these la- letters that just outline uh, real life conflict, real life controversy, real life struggle, and so that we have this to look back on and, and to read and say, man, does, do, do, do the lessons that they learned apply to my life? Can I imitate this? Can I learn from this? And so help us now as we're in our own battles, in our own conflicts, to learn what we can from these people that went before us and ultimately follow those words and those actions of our Savior, Jesus. If there is division, if there is conflict for, for in the lives of anyone who's hearing this message, God, I pray for the Holy Spirit to come into the middle of that and allow this to happen. Allow those differences to be acknowledged, but also those similarities to come to light so that there could be a, a reunification, God, so that we could be reunited with each other and with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, wait, wait, before you go, three things. First, consider becoming one of Cornerstone Fellowship's financial partners. Uh, Your donations will ensure that you'll be able to continue enjoying helpful and hopefully life-changing messages like the one you just watched. And then number two, please share the link to this message with anyone who you know needs it or will be blessed by it or by posting the link to your own personal social media platforms, all of them. And finally, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell so you'll be alerted whenever we post more content. Thanks for watching.